It is an absolute honor and privilege for me to be here amongst so many like-minded, open-minded people who are here fundamentally to celebrate the spirit of love in the world. So many great experts on the subjects of the plant medicines and, and uh, cannabis in particular. I feel, uh, I feel humbled to be part of this, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have been asked to speak here. So <clears throat> you may wonder why I have a picture of the Temple of Hathor at Dendera up on the screen. Um, I want to talk, uh, it's a little it's a sort of parable or a metaphor. I want to talk a little bit about an ancient system of ideas called Gnosticism and how this relates to the world that we're living in today and relates to the cannabis issue in particular. Actually, we would not be able to hear the Gnostics speak in their own voices if it were not for a discovery that was made in 1945 very near this ancient Egyptian temple in uh, Upper Egypt at a place called Nag Hammadi. And at a place called Nag Hammadi in 1945 by an Egyptian farmer was found buried beside a great rock a number of pottery jars. And in those pottery jars were about 15 books, codices, as they're called. That's some of them there. The farmer didn't know what he had, actually. He took them back to his family, and his mother used several of the books as kindling in the fire before it occurred to him that they might have some monetary value. He proceeded to sell the books on the black market. They date actually to 400, roughly 400 after Christ, 400 of our era. And they are the scriptures, the ideas, the system of thought of Gnosticism. In the early centuries of Christianity, the Gnostics were one of the Christian sects. But at the time of the Emperor Constantine, another Christian sect, which took the biblical teachings extremely literally, became the Roman Catholic Church, was raised to prominence. And the very first thing they did, the very first thing they did was destroy the Gnostics with murder and cruelty and genocide, to destroy their books, to rub them out from the face of the earth. A small group of Gnostics, seeing what was coming, buried a library of their texts. <coughs> and that library came into the world in 1945. Now, the essence of Gnosticism is that there is a divine spark within us. I won't go into the cosmology of how it got there, but essentially it's trapped within us and the only way out is through the saving knowledge of Gnosis. The cosmology is really very complex. I'm, I'm not going to go into it here. If you want to read translations of the entire Gnostic texts, I recommend this book, edited by James N. Robertson. It's a complete translation of the entire Gnostic text. These texts are a time bomb. These texts are an antidote to the mind control that has existed in the world for the last 2,000 years. That's why they were suppressed. And that's why it's significant that they've come out in our time. And what they say, I can't, of course, give you the whole Gnostic story, but what they say is shocking, absolutely shocking, to those who adhere to the three monotheistic faiths, to Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. Because what Gnosticism is actually saying is that the entity that we have been taught to believe is God that entity is not God at all. Whether we call him Allah or Yahweh or Jehovah, that is not God. That is a minor, pumped up, jealous, egotistical, controlling, murderous supernatural. 
which has passed itself off as God. You know the movie The Usual Suspects? There was a line where it said the greatest trick the devil ever played has to convince the world he did not exist. Gnostics take it a step further. The greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world that he is God. The Gnostics call that entity the Demiurge. And he surrounds himself with evil angels called archons who disguise themselves as human beings and mingle with us and lead us into all manner of frauds and reckless crime and wars and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. We've been worshipping an imposter for the last 2,000 years whose purpose is to lead us astray and to snuff out the divine spark within us. So the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden turns everything upside down. We've been taught to believe that the serpent is the bad guy. From the Gnostic point of view, the serpent is the good guy. The serpent has come to teach us that we cannot become fully human until we know the difference between good and evil, eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We have to know the difference because if we don't know the difference, we're just meat robots. We're not making choices, and it's through our choices that we grow or shrink as beings. We have to have that choice, and that's what the serpent is bringing to Adam and Eve, saying, here is Gnosis. This is your path. And of course, for eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what happens to Adam and Eve, they're driven out of the garden. In a humiliating way, angels appear and beat them around. Those would be archons, by the way, and beat them about the bottoms with the flats of their swords and drive them out of the garden to which they may never return, lest they discover the tree of life and become gods like us. That passage is actually in the book of Genesis. And uh, another example, according to the Gnostics, the, the flood was not sent to punish evil. It was sent to snuff out the light that was growing in mankind. And the survivors were thrown into great distraction and into a life of toil so that mankind might be occupied with worldly affairs and might not have the opportunity of being devoted to the Holy Spirit. Let's just imagine for a moment that in some way the Gnostics were right. If their scheme of things is correct, how might these archonic, these demiurgic forces manifest in the world today? Well, I would say that these are the ways they manifest. Through the three monotheistic faiths, which all talk the talk of peace and love, but down the generations they have walked the walk of fear and hatred and suspicion. Big Pharma, the big corporations, they're all about separating us from choice over ourselves, over the lives that we choose to lead. Big media, and of course, big government, the ultimate manifestation of our conic power in the 21st century. And all of this flourishing and controlling us how? Controlling us through consciousness. That's how you control human beings. You get hold of their consciousness and you lock it in chains. You shut it down. You close off that divine light within us and don't allow us to realize that it's there. So, this notion that archons are at work amongst us, enslaving our bodies, our souls, through the control of our consciousness, is helpful when we ask ourselves, why is it that some people are so fucking rabid, interfering, and punitive about other people's use of consciousness-altering drugs and plants, notably cannabis? I mean, we've had nearly 50 years of that evil and wicked enterprise called the war on drugs. So what is it that those in power are really afraid of? It's not altered states of consciousness as such, because we have lots of stuff that's part of our daily life that's there because it 
alters consciousness. I mean, I like the taste of coffee, but fundamentally I drink it to wake myself up. And uh, what about booze, you know? The most boring drug on the planet. <laughs> Truly a dangerous drug, too. Causes tens of thousands of deaths every year. Cirrhosis of the liver is a growing problem, particularly amongst young women from, from binge drinking. Women have smaller livers than, than men. The, the, the violence, the, the road accidents, the, just the sheer lack of decorum of the whole thing. And yet it's, it's glorified in our society, promoted, advertised, associated with all sorts of desirable lifestyles. And yeah, I mean, a glass of wine can taste okay, but fundamentally we're not drinking that glass of wine for the taste. We're drinking it because of the alteration in consciousness it brings. That little buzz, that little chill out at the end of the day. It's a consciousness altering drug. And, and then, of course, big pharma. Licensed to make billions of dollars every year producing consciousness altering drugs, which alter our consciousness in horrible ways which shut us down and numb us and minimize us. I speak from experience. I had a long encounter with depression in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, and I was put on to Prozac and uh, Siroxan. Horrible, horrible drugs, dreadful drugs. It's the only time in my life when I tried to come off Siroxan that I found myself seriously considering suicide. You know, Graham, it's just the best thing to do. Just get rid of yourself. That's when I realized my mind was being poisoned. And I worked very hard. It took me six months to get off those horrible drugs. But I got off them in the end. So why is it that big pharma, you know, I mean, these drugs are also dangerous. They're associated with suicides, large numbers of suicides. Why is big pharma allowed to do that? And yet we're persecuting and suppressing other consciousness altering so-called drugs. Actually. We're incredibly complex, amazing. I mean, to be born in a human body, what a gift. What a gift from the universe. Many states of consciousness are available to us. But uh, our society, what it particularly values is what I call the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. And. Uh, our society is very focused on that state of consciousness. Now, I'm not saying that there's no place for the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. The alert problem-solving state of consciousness definitely does have a place. I mean, to be honest, when I get on an airplane, I would like the pilot to be in an alert problem-solving state of consciousness. And I would like him to stay that way until he lands me safely on the ground at the other end. After that, I don't care what his state of consciousness is. There is a place for it. But the problem, I would suggest, is our over-monopolistic focus upon it in our society, to the exclusion of all other states of consciousness. Even dreaming, for example. In the ancient world, dreams were considered a path to true knowledge, worthy and valuable in themselves. In our world, if you call someone a dreamer, well, you're insulting them. So I, I would say that it's plausible that you know, alcohol, the antidepressants, caffeine, they're tolerated because they don't challenge. And actually, they may support the dominance of the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. That brief holiday from your alert problem-solving state perhaps makes you more efficient as an alert problem-solver. But cannabis and a number of, uh, of other plant medicines, <laughs> what they lead to is questioning of the established control system of our society and of the states of consciousness that, that serve it. And I suggest that is why these substances have been made illegal. And that is what those who run our world really fear, the waking up, the questioning of the population. So the alert problem-solving state of consciousness is good for all this shit, you know? It's good, for, it's good for the military, it's good for politics, it's good for commerce, it's good for all of that. And it's made this kind of endless promise. If we just buy into that, state of consciousness and commit to it fully that the world will become a wonderful place. And that is such a lie. That is so, so dishonest. We can't even solve the problem of hunger in the world with all our 
alert, problem-solving state of consciousness and all our resources, we yet cannot apply it to the fact that millions of people go to sleep hungry and starving every night, our brothers and sisters. We tolerate extraordinary pollution of this beautiful garden of a planet. We created nuclear weapons, and having created them, we allowed them to proliferate. Isn't it, isn't it just completely obvious that a society that creates and prol proliferates nuclear weapons is, in fact, insane? <laughs> we live in a completely, psychopathically insane society, and only a, an insane society could be behind and tolerate and allow the destruction of the rainforests, those sacred realms, those homes of biodiversity. Destroyed what? For the pursuit of short-term profits. It's, it's cattle ranching that is largely responsible for, 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 for dis the destruction of the rainforest. Chop down that rainforest and you know, ranch cattle and grow soya beans to feed cattle so we can all eat hamburgers. What an incredibly bad deal that is. It would not be a great problem for our wealthy technological societies to go to the peoples of the rainforest, the people of the Amazon Basin, for example, and say to them, you have a precious resource for all of us. We want you to care for it, and we will make, it, we will make the financial means available to you to care for this so that it becomes in their self-interest not to allow the forest to be cut down. It wouldn't even cost us very much. I, a few years ago, I did a calculation on the back of an envelope. It looked like, you know, that was back at the time of the, the Iraq war. It looked like six months' expenditure on that war would have solved the problem of the Amazon forever. But we can't do that. We just don't make that choice. Our consciousness, the consciousness, the dominating consciousness of our society will not make that choice. It's capable of raising countless trillions of dollars, just limitless, infinite amounts of money for this stuff, for warfare, for destruction, for ever more sophisticated ways to murder and slaughter one another and multiply human misery. And the forces behind this, well, they operate by manipulating fear and hatred and suspicion, spread this all around the world, put us into a constant state of anxiety, which somehow justifies the insanity of investing massively in ways to destroy one another. And then, of course, we have the state, big government again, that ultimate manifestation of our conic power in the world today. The state that wants to take away all responsibility for us and to tell us everything that we must do doesn't want individual choice, wants us to do things in a programmed, organized way that, that they like. The state that, on the arguments of the war on drugs, has been allowed to create these giant armed bureaucracies, which are funded with our tax money, and which have the right to break into our homes and ruin our lives. Why? Because we are exploring the mystery and majesty of our own consciousness, using the sacred plant medicines while doing no harm to others. Obviously, we're in the hands of a psychopathic system here, a psychopathic system that desperately needs to be changed. Because you know the exact same forces that are wrecking the world we live in today, the warmongers, the poisoners, the polluters, the spreaders and multipliers of hatred, fear, and suspicion, they are the forces that made cannabis illegal in the first place and that want to keep it that way. So I would say that a society's attitude towards cannabis and its behavior towards those adults who choose to use cannabis is actually an excellent litmus test for everything else in that society as well. Now, I realize that there are a lot of issues, and there are serious and meaningful issues, uh, around the question of the legalization of cannabis in Canada. Um, it is not proceeding as many of us would wish it to proceed. And yet, personally speaking, that's a price I'm willing to pay. Because if a government steps up 
and steps out of line from the rest of the iconic system and legalizes cannabis. That at least is one step forward. Then we can begin to dismantle the lies of the war on drugs. Colorado very kindly has been doing that for us for quite a while. Uh, you know, all the predictions of, of the chaos that would descend, the, the, the bloodbath, the, the road accidents, the, the murders, the suicides when cannabis was legalized in Colorado were all proved completely false. Actually, it's been a very positive experience and a very positive thing for everybody in Colorado. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to show that the emperor wears no clothes. And the only way we can show that is to have situations where cannabis is freely available to adults of their own choice without fear of sanction or legal consequences. And for that reason, with reservations, I, I applaud the step that Canada is taking. I think, it's, I think it's important. We'll be able to say to those who want to keep cannabis suppressed, but look at Canada. It's working there. Look at, look at Colorado. It's working there. All this stuff that you're trying, all this fear you're trying to fill me with is complete bloody nonsense, actually. So fuck off and go away. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's not actually an accident that uh, it's uh, around cannabis issues in the dominator cultures of the world today that we see the most effective initiatives of civil disobedience and the most effective questioning of the established control structure. In a way, although we didn't know it, we're part of a revolution that's taking place. Humanity is in a time of transition right now. In a historical perspective, 200 years from now, when we look back on this time, if the human race gets through the next 20 years, 200 years from now, when we look back on, on this time, it will be looked at as an epochal moment in the human story, a moment when a great transition was made, when we finally discovered who we are and learned to throw off those iconic chains and, and nourish the divine spark and the, and the spirit within them. The, the questions and, and, and initiatives around cannabis have, have the potential not only to, to free the weed, but to free the rest of society as well. So, you know, it's not about getting high. I like getting high. <laughs> Very much. But it's not about that. The war on drugs, the drug warriors, they want to trivialize the issue. They want to say that it's, you know, that it's about, it's, a, it's about a trivial and worthless thing and that the downsides of it are so great that it's got to be kept illegal. A guy like Jeff Sessions, whose picture I showed at the beginning, is a classic example of, of that. Yeah. <laughs> Dear God, I mean, what is that man doing as Attorney General of the United States? Um, so... What it's really about is our society's attitude towards individual liberty. That's what it's about. Western civilization, which is the source of the, the whole technological global culture that, that we have today, Western civilization would claim that its great gift to humanity uh, has been freedom, has been liberty has been democracy. Actually, we're so convinced that that's the great gift we've given that we go around the world forcing other people to be democratic. But actually, uh, nothing wrong with democracy, of course, but de de democracy is a system whereby you actually vote for somebody else and then you hand over to your power to that person for the next four or five years. Um, it, isn't, uh, it isn't necessarily uh, associated with, uh, with freedom. And uh, if you want to get to the heart of that, look at the way that cannabis is treated in the Western technological societies. I mean, America, the United States of America, has undoubtedly been the dark force behind the international war on drugs for 50 years. 
So I take hope from the fact that it is the American people, state by state, who are rolling that back, who are rolling that back and insisting on their right as adults to experience cannabis if they wish to do so while doing no harm to others. State by state, that system is being rolled back in the United States. And I believe that that is going to be part of a, a worldwide process of awakening. All our highfalutin talks about freedom and democracy and how freedom is the central value of our society are proved to be utter bullshit by the war on drugs. Because if I am not free as an adult to make sovereign choices about my own consciousness, my own body, and my own health, always with the proviso of while doing no harm to others, if I'm not free to make those choices about that most intimate, that most sapient, that most personal part of ourselves, our consciousness, if I'm not free to make choices about my own consciousness, then I am not free in any sense. No other freedoms can be meaningful until that freedom is put in place. And that's ultimately what we're getting to grips with around the issue of cannabis. We are getting to grips with the issue of asserting our absolute right to make choices over our own consciousness because we are here to learn and to grow and to develop. And we will not do that if we hand over authority over the most important part of ourselves, if we hand over the keys of our consciousness to the state. We must take those keys back. Once we take those keys back, then freedom truly can, can flourish. But until those keys are taken back, freedom is grievously restricted and we are in the hands of the, of the archons. So I think we live at a great moment, certainly a very interesting time. Um, I am optimistic. I'm, I'm hopeful for what's going to happen. I'm hopeful for gatherings like this. I'm hopeful for the awakening that's taking per place in the world. I believe that uh, the human spirit is a powerful thing, and it will, and it will come through, and it, is, and it is coming through now, and it's coming through very much in relation to that uh, great uh, teacher plant, uh, cannabis. I'll be talking tomorrow about my own personal, very long and curious relationship with cannabis. Um, but I wanted to address uh, these issues today. And uh, I think I'm pretty much done, unless anybody would like to ask me a question. Any questions? Yes. Why are you so obvious? Why am I what? Why are you so obvious? Well, that's very sweet of you <laughs> I, to say that. I don't. <laughs> that's very sweet of you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm certainly not awesome. Um, any other questions? Yes. Genetically modified cannabis? Well, in a sense, I mean, the, the, all the cannabis we're dealing with in the world today has been genetically modified by human beings, you know, for a, for a very long time. If you're talking about the, you know, the Monsanto way of functioning, I, I'm not sure that would be helpful at all. But, but uh, we have been working with this plant for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, I mean and, 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 and working with it and crossing different strains and looking for what we, for what we want in the plant. I think, that's, I think that's right and proper. I don't, I don't find, a, find, find a problem with that. And, it's, and again, though, that issue of those thousands of years is worth remembering. Um, because, because again, this is one of the, the archonic mistakes of our society. Uh, I mean, our society really, Western technological civilization, it's, it's like a little pimple on the brow of human experience. We have been around for, you know, 200,000 years as anatomically modern humans. We've been having experiences. How arrogant and stupid it is for a society that's so young 
you know, that the, for a, the war on drugs is 50 years old, to say that it, this is the way and to just discount the whole of the human story and our sacred and committed relationship to the teacher plants, that we should let that go because of developments in the last 50 years is just sheer, sheer madness. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's a re that's a really good good question, and I'm not I'm not sure I have an answer to it. Except except that all of us all the time should always speak our truth. We should never fear. We should always always speak out, always expose what is what it what is going on. Um, I, I I what I do not want to see. What I hope we never see is the transition from the war on drugs and illegal cannabis to a, to a legal state of cannabis where it's all in the hands of big pharma. That would be terrible. That would be the archonic victory over this matter, and that we, we must not allow it to happen. But I think the only way to, to stop it happening is from the awakening of consciousness, because these entities that you speak of have their fingers in many other pies as well, and they're causing chaos everywhere. We need to, we need, my computer is buzzing. The archons. Uh, my God. Uh, yeah, we have to. We and we don't have to buy their shit. That's the other thing, you know. Don't don't empower them with our with our money, ever. Yeah. Yes. I kind of look at it as this way: is that we're under control of a cultural consciousness. Yeah. No. Right? So he's under c control of it. So just us being here changes that. Yeah. And small groups of people linked together with your heart will change things. Beautiful. Running, singing, loving, song. Yeah. Yeah. Aho. Oh. We, we, should, we, should we should never forget that, 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 that we are powerful as small groups of people. That is, the, 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 the fact that we're outnumbered and outgunned doesn't mean we're going to lose in the end. Because there's nothing more powerful than, as has long ago been said, than an idea whose time has come. And, and this is an idea whose time has come. And I think no matter how hard they try to suppress it, they're not going to succeed. Yes? Yeah, there's a few interesting countries. I mean, Spain and Portugal are pretty relaxed about cannabis. Holland has been for quite a long time, but not in a perfect way by any means. But why Canada? I'm not sure. I don't, I, I don't, know, I don't know why that is. Sorry? I'm really proud that Canada's... I am proud that Canada's doing this, doing this too, because I, I know I've, I've, I've been engaging and looking in on some discussions about this. There's a lot of criticism of your Prime Minister Trudeau about the way that he's handling this. Um, I, I don't know enough about Canadian politics to get, to get involved, really. But, but what I do know is that in the, on the international stage, at the level of heads of state and heads of government, he must be coming under an enormous amount of pressure not to do this. Mm -hmm. Especially with the Americans coming in and the way they did cannabis. Yeah, with, exactly, with the political change in, in, in America, which threatens the legalization of cannabis in those states of America that have voted for it. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's a great thing that Canada has taken the lead in this respect. And, and as I said, it's, it's part of that process of, of just showing that the emperor wears no clothes. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.